Hello my soccer universe, welcome to my official review of Euro 2020 which was played in 21. Uh, I want to keep the opening rather short. I am still celebrating Italy, you know uh, I've been supporting Italy for all my soccer fan life. So uh, I'm still very much enjoying this one. Watch my review on the final if you want to know more about that. What I want to do in this video, I want to do three things. I want to first start with my five most negative memories from the tournament. Then I want to give, based on my pre-tournament simulations, every team kind of a grade, what is their performance, based on their pre-tournament expectations in a way. So everyone gets a letter grade at the end. And then I want to finish on a high note on my most cherished memories from this tournament. And I would say without further ado, let's jump right in with the negative moments. Um, and we'll start at the, you know, number five to number one, where number, the, last, uh, the last one is the one that bugged me the most. Um, I have to say the first one did not bug me initially, but the more I think, think about uh, worse it gets. And that is um, group F, the group of death, with arguably the two most talented teams in there, Portugal and France. And the group play itself was most of the time intriguing and I have to say that the final of Group F was among the best days at the whole Euros. That's for sure. However, that those teams, that none of these teams made any deeper dent into the tournament was definitely one of the surprises of the tournament and yeah. It shows bad UEFA seeding and so on, uh, that teams not taking it seriously, maybe bad coaching. Um, it just did not work. I mean, France being eliminated, albeit in very spectacular fashion. Um, yeah. And then uh, the only thing that Portugal can take home is, is the top goal scorer trophy for Ronaldo, and that I think is contentious. So that was one thing big names, but big flops all throughout. The next one is the format uh, of this tournament. In a, I'm thinking of, of, of it in two ways. Uh, the first one is, of course, with all these third place teams hanging around uh, and waiting whether they have qualified or not. And um, yeah, I have to say this is something that has to be looked into. Uh, and uh, yeah, they want to expand on the third, third, third teams, which yeah, basically let's give everyone in UEFA a spot at the Euros. I don't like that either, but that format is horrible. Absolutely horrible. I think we can find a bad, better way. I actually wouldn't mind if we would reuse, although it's also cumbersome with groups of three, but if we would reuse the format from the 82 World World Cup where the top two teams from each of the six groups at once, then we have four groups of three with the top teams going to a semi final. I think this could be intriguing or not. There will be dead rubber games potentially in there, and I think that's why. We don't want to have that one because, the, um, you know, we already went through this evolution. So I guess it's not gonna, gonna, gonna happen. But 24 teams was always going to become cumbersome. I wish we go back to 16 teams. I think this was the perfect tournament format to me. Uh, but the other way that the format didn't like is the distribution of the venues. Um, and having, I didn't mind that uh, we had so many teams, especially in groups with home field advantage. And as we could see, all four semifinal finalists enjoyed their home field advantage. Um, however, what really uh, bugged me is that due to that, that all like the Netherlands had to play all their games in Amsterdam and the atmosphere in Amsterdam was always great. However, uh, then the other three teams were all in uh, Bucharest and the population there, I mean, if you have Ukraine, Austria, Northern Macedonia, this doesn't get you really excited. You got appeased with one of the greatest games of the entire tournament to finish it off, but that speaks of poor planning in a way. And then in addition, um, the other venue is Baku, which I think got the worst of all the games, but befitting the venue, as we'll talk in a second. Um, I also would have loved if the um, venues would have been more geographically uh, divided up. Rome, Baku, Sevilla, St. Petersburg. It just doesn't make any sense at all to me. Uh, also, you know, travel, COVID, whatever, it is just bad. It was that was just, just bad. 
And bad were also the stadiums in Sevilla and Baku, which I do not want to have any major uh, games played there. The stadium Baku, uh, and also the one, sorry, the cavernous monstrosities uh, that were made for athletics and not for soccer at all. And yes, I keep using the word soccer now. Um, it is horrible stadiums, absolutely horrible. No atmosphere in there. I mean, even when Azerbaijan hosted the Turkish national team and there are many fans cheering them on, there was hardly any atmosphere there. Uh, I, I, at the stadium, it just looks like every, everyone is like uh, miles away from the pitch. In addition to, of course, yes, UEFA needing to appease the Azerbaijani government because they have been funding UEFA for a while, SOCAR. Uh, and then um, I do understand, I actually, from a sports political point, point of view, I think I understand why you want to give a venue also to Eastern Europe when you have been doing that because you know you need to spread it out. It can't be all in Western Europe. Taken. But Azerbaijan... Sorry. And the same goes for St. Petersburg in many ways. So, uh, yeah. Then the one in Sevilla. I mean, that stadium. The only thing that you should do with this stadium is put a ton or more than that of dynamite around it and press push the button. This stadium, I already disliked it for the Spanish Cup final. I mean, without fans, it's probably all right and it has uh, probably decent angles, but this stadium had a horrible pitch, incredible heat in Sevilla, although most games were at least played in the uh, evening, which took a little bit that fact factory, uh, as opposed to now Baku also, due to the time difference, but yeah, that didn't work. But then what's even more is for, uh, especially for the choice of that stadium in Sevilla, the Katucha. Uh, and I was talking to that uh, with my brother on the weekend. We said, you know, Spain has so many world class stadiums that you could choose from. Yes, okay, you cannot play in the Basque country. What are stadiums that you could play for that would have a good atmosphere and so on? I mean, the first one that comes to mind, yes, Bernabeu is being rebuilt and you do not play anything in, uh, in the new camp. You could go in the new uh, stadium for Espanyol. You could go in the Mestalla. Wonderful stadium. Of course, not up to UEFA specifications, as is the Villa Marina and the Pisuan in Sevilla itself. But there you have two stadiums that are so much better than the Catuja. But then uh, to really make this nonsensical, you have the perfect stadium that just hosted the Champions League final in Madrid. No, I'm not talking about the Panama, I'm talking about the Wanda Metropolitano. Perfect stadium for that. Much better stadium than this uh, ab abomination. So yeah, that really, really bugged me. But now, what bugged me more are the latter two. Um, I have written fan behavior and I'm talking mainly about two groups in there. And um, um, there might have been other groups that have been misbehaving, but these two stuck out for me. First of all, the Hungarians. I'm not talking about the general Hungarian fans. I'm talking about those black shirted uh, ultra fans behind the goal in both the Hungary games in Budapest and then when they played in Germany. Those thugs from the Carpathian League, most of them, and you know, they were put there by a government that was making sure that is. Uh, uh, promoting nationalistic views. And yes, we always say that uh, watching an international tournament, it's a nice nationalism. No, it is being abused over and over again. And I did not like this one bit. And uh, I'll talk to you later, uh, my uh, indication for those. The Hungarian team, I actually was uh, kind of feeling with, with them uh, and even supportive because they really uh, gave it their all. They were rank outsiders in their group and they played very well and really did their country in many ways proud. Uh, cannot say anything bad about them. However, what the, the fans are doing, no. They're even banned now. They have no fans for the next two games. That's how bad this got. And the other group, yes, it is definitely clouded since I consume most of my news in German and in English, so I heard about these uh, the most. But the English fans, especially in the latter stages of the tournament. Um, 
I'm talking booing the national anthem of your rival, which then suddenly uh, popped up in other places as well, unfortunately. But that was the first time when England played Germany and I saw it against Denmark and I saw it in the final against Italy. I could not stand that. Booing also already started earlier on when they booed the kneeling, which is another thing that, uh, please, I have the feeling that, and I don't think that England is now the only nation for that. Uh, it's everywhere. It seems to be everywhere. But I had the feeling that, yes, we let people back in, but what people do we let in? All the idiots are coming back. I mean, we are making straight the jump from 2018 before, or 2019, to the uh, early uh, the 80s and 90s, when this was commonplace and you could misbehave yourself. Uh, there was so much evolution. Now that we finally can begin, yeah, we can misbehave ourselves again. This is what bugged me. Uh, that they then um, also, I mean, ahead of the final, I'm sorry, storming the stadium and in general causing all kinds of way, mayhem of Wembley way. And I hear now multiple re re reports this, it was not, that this was many, 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 many people that were doing that. Um, and then the racist tweets top it off. Honestly, it's an effing disgrace. Um, and I had to laugh about what Boris Johnson wrote, that those people should be ashamed of themselves. No, this is not how you get it. I mean, I would laugh at that, honestly. Uh, but there needs to be consequences as, as well. And I also thought, didn't expect this level of poor planning from the side of DFA and the English authorities. There goes a lot of stuff in there. Um, that was in many ways an appalling, and then, you know, speaking also of Super Spreader Sunday, uh, it just didn't fit the bill in many ways. And I heard that uh, one thing that saved us from a real mayhem in London was the bad weather and the fact that Italy had lost, uh, had won and England had lost and so the, settled the mood. Now, that was not happy. But what could top that? Well, the organizers of the entire tournament, UEFA themselves, kit rules. I made five v v videos reviewing this jersey matchup. Absolutely, absolutely hated that one. The handling of the Ericsson scenario, where you had to, uh, I mean, I understand there are certain rules, but it was not handled well at all. Uh, and then kind of, you know, maybe making up for it. It all seems so disingenuous and so contrived in many ways. The handling of all the political maneuvering, I mean, not only, um, uh, you know, when all these rainbow colors and race and kneeling came up, uh, UEFA was not clear, have, have, having a clear stance. When uh, Manuel Neuer came out with a rainbow colored uh, captain's armband, they made an investigation. When Munich wanted to make the um, stadium in rainbow colors, I actually do understand a little bit the line of arguing on their, on their part because it would be then the, uh, because this was motivated by the decision of another argument and you think that sense has to be apolitically, but it's not against your values. That then the sponsors suddenly had the rainbow colors for the rest of the tournament almost all around also seemed so contrived and false. Um, and then, of course, the COVID and crowds and the whole disaster with kind of forcing England to open up more spaces because otherwise we could give the final four to Budapest because there's a full stadium and that and then uh, canceling Ireland because uh, we cannot have any people in there. No, I mean, such short sightedness in the face of a pandemic. Absolutely, absolutely not fun. So these were my top five moments. As I said, I will have two more review videos up there. And let's see. Uh, let, let, let me know what, what moments you didn't like. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Please drop a line below. You might disagree with my point of view. And then, yeah, I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey, just in case you enjoyed this video, here are some videos and playlists that you actually might enjoy too. Also, please consider following me on social media and actually subscribe to my channel so that you stay updated with everything that happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.